Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this beautiful AWS migration webinar. This is Vishal Lingam, and thank you very much, Lila, for introducing myself. But before we get started, I'll quickly put myself on the screen. So that's me on the screen. You know, that's a real person talking to you in the bot here. And as you said, I've been the cloud industry for many many years i've done hundreds of migration over my period of my career i'm a champion amazon instructor and i'm a champion instructor with google cloud and microsoft which kind of gives me an opportunity to work in all the three cloud vendors. so i'm certified into pretty much everything that exists and that are in the market so you can say that i think i hold a decent experience and i think we're going to be sharing some great information about this. Now, before we start this course, and I'm going to quickly give you an insight about uh, this offering. So this is a, a three-day official course that we're going to give you a skim brief in the next two hours, probably, uh, where uh, we're going to be talking about the AWS migration strategy. And we have an official course from AWS called as Migrating to AWS, which is where you learn about different strategies. If you look at my screen here, this is the course I'm talking about, and this course is going to give you insight on how you can migrate on AWS and some of the strategies behind this, and how do we kind of put everything in that direction, like things like uh, portfolio discoveries and application migration, all those kind of objectives there. And if you do this course, it's a three-day offering, you understand what are different practices about it. And the question is, why do we migrate to AWS? Because the world is moving to cloud. Are we going to move in the same direction we want to move in the um in the in the in the in the capacity that we should be able to uh build a system that is on the AWS cloud and that is a very very important piece to know about so there are different ways that we can migrate our solution there are different technologies there are different solutions so for example you've got a database that is running on the prem and you want to host it on the aws ecosystem so how do we really go about that what is the right process what's the right procedure in doing that as a process and that is something we are going to be trying and address in this small webinar there so let me quickly come back here that's how this now, when we look at the part of the whole, uh, you know, migration perspective, um, one of the important things that you know we need to understand is uh, we need to really explore some of the uh, ways of how do we do this. I mean, there are different solutions, different ways, different mechanisms of how do we kind of do about this, and how do we kind of uh, build a system in that capacity. And that's a very, very important things have been to say. So when you look at this, uh, and anyway, I'm gonna talk about this eventually. See, migrating your existing application, and I guess that's to AWS or Amazon Web Services, kind of presents you an opportunity to transform the way your organization does business. It really helps you to lower the cost, become more agile, and develop these new skills more quickly. And you would be a deliver, you'd be able to deliver these reliable, globally available services to your customer. And the goal is to really implement your cloud strategy successfully. And AWS, you know, has identified a lot of key factors to successful life transformation through our experience engaging in terms of supporting these enterprise customers. AWS has organized these into what we call as a set of best practices for the successful cloud migration. The customer scenarios, they're gonna range from, you know, migrating these small and single application to migrating entire data center uh, with hundreds of applications. And we kind of give you an AWS on migration methodology there, which is really built on iterative and continuous progress. And it's important that we kind of discuss about those perspectives throughout the course there. So, you know, uh, one of the things about this, and over the next um, couple of hours, I'm gonna be taking a tap on on the topics around how can you define migration how we can analyze your environment and the needs and how do you plan the migration and eventually some of the services which are commonly used during your migration and maybe what could be the migration separate and one of the one of the things about this uh you know um, uh, when we kind of do this course and i want to bring this to attention because um if you are going to migrate to your social aws you have to know that everything sometimes it's not cloud native. So when something is not cloud native, that means your job becomes much more tough because you have to figure out how things work. So the first thing first, I mean, before even we kind of understand or address this as a perspective and give me a moment here, 
the first thing becomes is like when we say word migration what do we mean by that how do we define the word migration for us and that's why remember, why do we say that okay it's migration now when we kind of get into the part of it um and then kind of kind of start in that direction um i mean the question will be where do we really begin when starting down the path of the migration what do we mean, mean by uh the migration and the kind of the small webinar I can tell you cloud migration is nothing but the process of moving the data, moving your application or other business elements to a cloud computing environment. And whether it is a server, you want to retire some data you want to move or entire network environment that needs a new home, there are various types of cloud migrations and enterprise can perform. And, you know, um, there are so many methods which involved uh, taking you know some portion of your environment and moving it to the cloud there and depending on the migration type you choose to perform your migration will involve you know maybe one or maybe more than one service on media blues and you know i typically like to start this with a small part called as identifying the business drivers now since they tend to inform the technical decision and being able to answer the question like why should I even migrate? And it should always come before answering the question, how we should migrate. The question should be, why should you migrate? And the cloud really enables the levels of this agility that typically are not possible on the prem. For many companies, you know, the number one reason that they choose to migrate to the cloud is the agility and the speed that they can move with. And the migration process involves basically phases. And I call them, I call gonna define this migration process as a phase here. And give me a moment here. I'm going to actually do one thing while this will make it much more interesting for all of you. So when I say migration, it's about uh, the phases, right? Phase one belongs to, um, you can say, the prep. So we do the preparation, the migration. Then phase two is about, um, you know, um, um, and phase one, I can even say that, you know, just not the prep, but I would also say prep um, and, you know, our business planning. So I can say that phase one, before you can do anything is you have to prep and you have to do business plan. Phase two, I would call it more of the things that are very important called as portfolio discovery, where you do the discovery of, of the components there, right? Um, and even you can say discovery and planning. Phase three and four, I will combine both of them together. And let's call them as more of like um, design, migrate and maybe validate your application that's the part here and eventually the phase number five that i would define here in terms of migration we can call it as the phase that you operated i mean this is where you want to eventually do everything right and uh, these are the fours and, and i'm not going to be going into all these details all the details of this but i wanted to give you an aspect behind this whole process but let's say if you talk about the, the first phase which is the preparation or the business planning. So whenever you are evaluating migrations to AWS, the pattern seems around, or there's a kind of scene around to the cloud, they commonly follow this five phase approach. And the phases I can evaluate in this regard are phase one, which is a migration preparation and business planning. Phase two is portfolio discovery and planning. Phase three and four are designing, migrating, and validating your application. And finally, phase five is to operate. So if you thought, let's talk about the phase one. So when we're looking at the migration through this context, planning and preparation will be where most of the time and efforts are spent. Now, while individuals, non-crucial standalone systems may have an ability to be quickly moved over with a little planning, it's because these provide these minimal risk of impact. And you should have, should an issue occur, you are okay to make sure that they will not impact much of this. And most of the cases, the interconnectivity of the various components need more than just several hours of operational work. And these types of migration requires very detailed and insightful planning and preparation for both the technical and the business side of the operation, which is why I kind of start with the migration preparation and the business planning. And this is, I would say, and it has been the right uh, objectives are determined and getting an idea of the types of the benefits you will see begins. I mean, it starts with some foundational experience and developing, I would call it as a preliminary business case of migration. You're not just going to think about migration because you feel like you want to migrate. You've got to have a preliminary business case of migration, which requires taking these objectives into account along with the age and the architecture of these existing applications and their constraints 
uh, energy power. So that's I would call as the phase one. If I talk about, let's say, the phase number two. Now, you know, in phase two, we need to kind of take a deeper look at our IT portfolio. And the goal of the phase two, I would call it to establish where our dependencies are between our application and we begin to think about what types of migration work best for each. Not every application is likely to you know, fall into the same migration strategy. This phase with a focus on application discovery is, I believe, our best opportunity um, for building a clear use case and business case for each application. Depending on the age of your environment to be migrated, you may even identify applications that can fit clearly into the retired strategy. And the application discovery services can assist with this process by gathering information about environment. And that's that's kind of one of the part of it. If you move to the phase number three and four, which again is important, which is phase one, it involves planning analysis, phase two involves, uh, you know, uh, 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 Kind of a portfolio discovery phase three and four was still plan were designed but uh, then we want to migrate and validate and the kind of focus starts to shift from the portfolio level to the individual application level there we're designing and migrating and validating each application and each application is designed it's migrated and is validated according to you know uh one of the six common strategies or six r's of migration which i'm going to talk about um, soon there and from the previous phase, you know, there are a couple of things I want to specifically point out. Uh, one specific thing that is the need for the, each application to be designed, to be migrated, and to be validated. And according to what's necessary for those specific projects. Just like with other areas of building and architecting application needs to be looked individually, there needs a required assessment there. And, you know, maybe the architecting also is a part of this. You we kind of do that. And then they need to be treated in the way that's best fit for the best use case. And this is not the time to try and force a one size fits all type of mentality. I know this can sound like a lot, but once you have some foundational experience from migrating a few apps and planning plays that the organization can get behind, it becomes easier to accelerate the migration and achieve scale. And some more good news is that you know partners can help you here as well as AWS service migration service or AWS DMS or cloud endure migration kind of becomes the part of it. And finally, when we talk about, we get into this something called as the operate phase. So, so far in the phase one through four, we have discovered our application, planned their migration and implemented those strategies. In the phase five operate, we look at the ongoing operation of our application and the systems in the cloud and kind of look to continue iterating. And we've now created like a foundation that can be built on to further improve our operating environment. And during the planning phases, you may have found applications that were already the good candidates for retirement, but due to dependencies, they were unable to be removed from the environment. And this is the phase that we begin to look at how to turn off some of these old systems. And phase five, it is an ongoing phase, I would say. That, I mean, if you look at the phase five, eventually, um, you kind of take off all the information lessons you have learned from the migration and working towards a continual improvement. And there are many migration partners which are available to, uh, you know, uh, kind of kind of able to help you in all the cases. So again, you don't have to kind of start this journey all by yourself. There are um, a lot of people who will be able to help you. The problem. These companies, they have expertise in all the phases of the migration process and they can help with implementation and planning and even, you know, training on migration technologies. And, and that's something which there. So everything kind of happens in the migration upon these four phases. And when you go to cloud, one of the important things that cloud has to have here, what we call as the cloud adoption framework. And this is a very important thing. Now, there are a lot of tools and references which are available to you when you evaluate your needs for migration and cloud adoption. But from trusted third party, as well as from AWS directly, these will vary in focus in applicability. But they can be useful or helpful if you find, you know, the ones that I would say kind of, uh, you know, best fit the task you're trying to complete. And one of the references that can be helpful in the early stages of many migration is the AWS's cloud adoption framework or the CAF. And AWS professional services created this cloud adoption framework so they can help these organizations design and travel and accelerate path to a successful cloud adoption. And the guidance and the best practice provided by the framework can really help you 
build a comprehensive approach to the cloud computing across your organization and throughout your eyes life cycle, I would say. And the cloud adoption framework kind of covers what I would say as six important perspectives to consider when to look at the cloud adoption plan. And the business perspective kind of uh, look at the business people and governance and there's a technical perspective that focuses on the platform, the security and operation. And the business perspective, I would say, of the cloud adoption framework is more about to help us move from separating these strategies for business and IT and to kind of go towards to do a business modeling and strategies. And the people perspective focus, I believe, is on prepping the team for the cloud adoption by really obtaining the staff skill and all the organizational processes around this to include kind of these cloud-based competencies there. And the governance is also one of the things that we have to think about is, the, is, is more about that we want to integrate our IT governance, our organizational governance, and it provides the guidance on identifying and implementing, you know, best practices for IT governance and on supporting these business processes with technology. And on the technical side, the platform perspective is going to help to design, I would say, or implement and optimize the architecture of AWS technology. And based on the business goals and objectives, by helping to really provide you a strategic guidance for designing and this having a lot of principles and tools and policies and that's how you can do it so you have this whole cloud adoption framework which kind of build a system a process which can eventually help you to achieve that and that's something i believe is an extremely important step that we have to think about at all pace at how and when we want to do this so we want to adopt the cloud adoption framework at all part of things and there are basically five pointers remember that that happens to exist in the caf and these are i talk about so as i look at doing business we have to think about what are my business repercussions there what is the platform what is who are the people what is the security um governance and ops and i want to put all of them together there now in terms of this, you know, uh, one of the important things that I can tell you, which happens in the cloud adoption, is a cultural change. I mean, there are these cultural issues which are at the root of many failed business transformation. Yet most of the organization do not even uh, assign an explicit responsibility for the culture. And culture is critical to cloud migration. Cloud adoption can fail to reach a maximum potential if companies do not really consider the impact of the culture to the people or in the process. You can't just start with this whole journey eventually and um, just, just go blind. I mean, we have these on-prem infrastructure which has been historically managed by people and even with the advance in servers virtualization, most companies have not been able to implement the level of automation that the cloud can provide. And the AWS platform provides customers the instant access to the infrastructure, to the application services through what we call as a pay-as-you-go processing model. And we can automate the provisioning of these AWS resources using AWS service APIs. And as a result, we have these roles and responsibilities uh, with the organization that will change as application teams take more control of the infrastructure and application service. So the impact of culture, believe it or not, it's very, very effective. It's very imperative. It's declarative. It's in the direct format. So the impact of the culture is important. And the cloud and culture does not need to be a daunting or an arduous proposition. Be aware and uh, uh, an intention about the cultural changes you're looking to drive and manage the people side of the change and measure and track these cultural change there, just as you would do that with the technology. And then I remember that I have done these migration many times. And most of the times I have found in the organization is they're not uh, exposed to the cloud, that they have issues, they have problem in terms of adopting new things. And that's okay because we are humans. We don't really like changes as much in there. So I would say when I'm going to do this organizational change uh, to accelerate our cloud transformation, uh, the way I would define this um, in eventuality um, it's going to be a, a kind of a process okay so one thing that you know i would do here initially you know when i when i did migrations i'm going to tell you a, a, my, some of my experience behind the process because 
migration is less of tools, more about people. So what I did first is I mobilized the teams and I had to align the leaders. That means this change is critical and it will succeed because if everyone becomes a bit of a change here. So the objective is I had to confirm the sponsorship. I have to secure the resources and expertise there form a strong coalition of leaders, build a momentum there, and eventually, which will help me to form teams to lead the chain, executive sponsors, stakeholders, line leaders, PMOs, or chain management communication there. And I wanted to establish a program charter role. I wanted to build these guiding coalitions to which can help you to mobilize leadership, shape these program governance structure, assess and align these chain leadership. And once I'm able to do this, um, the way I define this process is, uh, um, I kind of said, you know what, everyone, you all need to um, envision the future. This is what I wanted them to do is um, envision the future so that uh, they kind of start working. And then obviously I had to, um, the way I would say is uh, engage the org. I mean, the whole point of vision is where we are going. And this is how we can get that together, right? So I had to articulate the vision and the roadmap for them to transition the cloud and mobilize these realization, build commitments, create those change urgency, establish these communication there. So the uh, we, we kind of define this as like a, a an OCM framework, which is an organizational chain management, which kind of guides you through these, uh, how do you mobilize your people, align those leadership and envision the future eventually, uh, or the future state of operating in the cloud there, which engaging your organization beyond the IT environment and allows you to have a capable capacity and making all of those changes to stick long term. So, you know, business drivers kind of becomes a lot more sense. So which I said the first thing that if I'm starting everything, then the phase one is is more important. Everyone asks me, okay, Michelle, that's all right. That sounds fantastic. How do we go about it? And I mean, the number one reason customers choose to move to cloud is for the agility uh, they gain the right. And the AWS Cloud provides you more than 100 plus services uh, from compute and storage and DBs and networking to CI and CD and data analytics and artificial intelligence. And you are able to move from an idea to implementation in a minute so rather than the months it can take to provision these services on the brim. And apart from the agility, uh, on one more common reason customers kind of migrate to the cloud uh, is to increase the productivity or maybe to have their data centers consolidation done or have a rationalization there and prep for an acquisition or something like that there. And there's always <clears throat> a way that you want to reduce the cost. So when we look at this, maybe I'm looking for operational cost measure. Maybe I'm looking for my workforce productivity, which is like how efficiently you're able to get your services to the market. You can quickly provision AWS services, which uh, you can say increases your productivity by allowing you to focus on things that make your business more different rather than spending time on the things that we really don't like managing the center of that. I wanna maybe do something called as cost avoidance. Now it's cost avoidance is basically a term which you would use when you are trying to set up an environment that does not create unnecessary costs. So you wanna eliminate the need for the hardware refresh and maintenance program, which is a key contributor to the cost avoidance. And the customer tells AWS that, hey, you know what, they don't understand the cost and the effort required to execute these big refresh cycle or uh, have a data center renewal. They're not interested in that. And why you do and do this? Because when you're trying to do this whole process of the prep phase, you are trying to be resilient. You want to make sure that when I go to cloud, I don't have, I want to have a downtime, right? So operational resilience is reducing your organization's risk profile and the cost of risk revision. And there are more than you know, 16 plus regions combined comprising 42 availability zones, um, and and you know, or I think more than that. We've got about I think more than that. Let's see how many zones we have. I kind of think you remember that. If you look at the AWS dot infrastructure, so if you leave, we've got 25 region, 81 availability zone. So we've got a global distributed there. So our operation can be resilient there. And with AWS, you can deploy your application in multiple regions around the world, which again improves your uptime 
reduces your risk of cost. And once they go to migrate to AWS, um, I have seen customers who have improved or have seen the improvements in their application performance and maybe have a better security. Maybe they have reduced these high severity incidents there. And that's a point which is there. And it all kind of makes your business to be a lot more agile. And when I say agile, what I'm trying to say here is that we want to react quickly to these changing market conditions. So when you migrate to the AWS cloud, really helps increase your overall operational agility. You can expand into new markets, take products to, to the market quickly and acquire assets that offer a competitive advantage. And you also have the flexibility to speed up the diverse future or acquisition of different line of business. So you have an opportunity to go full fledged and kind of move from there. And that becomes an extremely important aspect. And you know, when we do this, uh, this whole journey of the processes and uh, move, move in a segment, one of the things that uh, kind of kind of happens to, to do is what we're thinking of. So there is an impact of the culture in the cloud market, which is what I've said already. It pays a very important aspect. So we want to be careful of how we want to be able to kind of to find that process and you know once you do this um i think the the the, the important aspect that needs to um happen for us eventually is um i would call it is more of like um that how do we really migrate and the way we migrate is what are my migration strategies everything in this segment kind of goes and revolve around this model that what could be my micro strategies how do we define those strategies or process and this is where you start to develop a migration strategy eventually and consider where your cloud journey fits into organization there like a larger business strategy and find opportunities for the alignment of the vision there i mean if you don't have a well aligned um micro strategy uh, with the supporting business case and a well thought on market plan it's going to be a problematic situation there. A eh? so so that's something which is there. When you when you kind of uh, look at these processes, these eventualities, you have to understand there at all point of time that no matter how you do it, if I'm not planning things effectively, you know that things will not really work out. I mean, you will have a failure. You will have an issue which is going to cause your strategy to kind of go complete or solo and you will be having problem. And I can tell you different scenarios around that process um, where, where you know, um, you could imagine that uh, at all point of time, uh, I've seen that people realize that, okay, we're going to start with a specific segment there, but the moment this kind of uh, closed down uh, uh, in this process, uh, they are able to realize that whatever they thought about this um, and eventually that kind of got done. So I've seen people that they realize that, okay, we should get started, we should create a model and then apply a model, but then what is, they didn't realize that, oh, we didn't took the people in place there. And then they didn't, didn't took the people in the place, they kind of uh, move the journey and <clears throat> they can say, okay, how do I do it? And people are not aware about the solution. So now the technology, the culture, everything kind of begins to change. So this is very important that we have to build a migration strategy. And uh, one of the critical aspects of developing your migration strategy is to collect application portfolio data, rationalize it into what I refer is the six R's of the migration, which is rehost, replatform, refactor, repurchase, retire, and retain. If I'm gonna write this, and I will do that six factors of migration. And which is basically rehost, the platform, um, we say refactor, repurchase, retire, retain. Now, these are the six factor which I'm caught kind of have it important. And um, this is a method of categorizing what is an environment and what are the inter interdependencies are, the technical complexities to migrate and how you go about migrating each application or set of applications. So using the six R framework, 
which I can explain to you here, or I wouldn't say explain to you, but I'm defined here. You can group your applications into rehost, replatform, refactor, repurchase, retire, and retain. And using this knowledge, you will be able to outline what I would call a migration plan there. It's not MIC, it's MIG. Sorry about that. So you're going to be able to define a migration plan for each of the applications which are in a portfolio. And that plan will be iterated on and mature as you progress through the migration and build confidence and learn new capabilities and you know, better understand your existing state there. And the complexity of migrating your existing application kind of varies depending on consideration like architecture, what are existing license agreements there, business requirement. For example, say if I'm migrating a virtualized um, service-owned architecture, it is at a low complexity in a spectrum. But if I have a monolithic mainframe, that's a very complex to move in there. And typically you want to begin with an application on a low complexity end of the spectrum to allow for a quick win to build this team confidence and to provide a learning experience. And you also want to choose an application that has business impact there. So these strategies will really help us to build a momentum. And if we talk about the first two, let's say we talk about the rehost and the replatform, which I believe is important. You know, the way this, <clears throat> sorry, the whole thing would operate there, you know, um, one of the important thing about Apple infrastructure, I mean, you have to evaluate uh, the areas to analyze in the portfolios and, and obviously some of the ways to discover the necessary components within our application. And you want to have a way to keep looking at those uh, kind of kind of objectives behind the scene there. So when we look at this perspective of these scaling considerations there, right? Um, one of the major motivation of uh, and benefits to migrate to cloud, as I said before, um, and one of the and this is where I'm going to kind of define this. So one of the benefits that um, you know I would have here is I would call it as a, so where is this gone now? Scalability. So scalability is one thing. That is the reason I want to go to cloud, right? And, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now. Now, while scaling is a great deal and a wonderful thing, there are some things that need to be considered. I mean, depending on your application, there are all sorts of things that may change how you're scaling. And some of the things you are um, 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 going to look maybe in terms of scaling constraints or maybe things like session data management or there are these major scaling methodologies there. So starting when I talk about constraints, it's important to cover because not everything can scale in the same way. If you have a limited number of licenses and getting more requires a lot of time, their approval may be just a lot of processes to work through. And dynamically scaling can be very difficult or perhaps your application just can't support the downtime it would take to change the underlying architecture so that it can handle more of a workload. In those cases, architecting in such a way so that you don't have to dynamically scale would be a way to go. And looking at adding other components to help when you can't scale, I think would be a good way to design around this. And resources like managed caches and queues can help not to lose requests when your scaling is limited there. And also offloading a lot of unnecessary work from these unscalable servers could really help. So if you're working with like a caching server, let's say, and increasing its resources is going to be difficult for it. Perhaps it would be easier if stale data was life cycle of the servers to conserve storage and not really over provision and overspend there. And strategies like this are just some of the ways you can work around these constraints. But what if you have resources that technically can scale, but you don't want to lose session data in the process? Well, since you thought about this, I'll tell you. Um, no need, I was, I mean, <laughs> it's a prop to lead me this. I mean, think about this. I mean, so if your application has session, session data that you're trying to maintain, but also need to scale to adjust um, the changes of demand, the easiest thing to do is store your session data off the instant. Using off server session storage can really help building or uh, can help provide scaling in what could otherwise be a very constrained environment. So using data store caches uh, can really help to maintain functionality and not really limit your scaling capabilities there. And uh, that's one thing. And then, you know, one of the things about this that, that, that we, we can handle horizontal and um, a vertical scaling, and uh, that's also very important, right? I mean, there are two kinds of scaling that we normally do. So we do a horizontal scaling, we do a vertical scaling. The horizontal scaling um, um, or, or, or scaling out is when we add more resources and distribute across them. And the benefit of this is it incurs no downtime for your original resource. And as the load continues to grow, we can continue to add more and more resources and spread the load across them. And once your load 
subsides and we need less resources, I can we can scale back into the original number. And this is kind of done with little to no impact to your end user there, and that's horizontal scaling. You add more resource there. And the other type of scaling is vertical scaling. With vertical scaling, you maintain the same logical resource, but you're making that resource more capable, like more power there, and adding things like memory storage or compute power so that resources can handle more of the workload. So with this type of scaling, or uh, you don't have to distribute requests multi across multiple big tasks, uh, you can still um, have those one logical resource. And there are some limitations on those part of it, which can really happen to work with it. So, so we can actually, um, Think about think about those perspectives there. And when you look at these whole restore uh, rehost models, so rehost is also sometimes referred as lift and shift. And basically, you want to move applications without changes. And in a large scale legacy migration organizations are looking to move quickly so they can meet their best objectives. And the majority of these applications are rehosted without implementing any cloud optimization. It could save roughly, you know, I would say, 20 30 percent of the cost by just rehosting. And most Rehosting can be automated with tools like AWS VM import and export, and some customers they prefer to do this manually as they learn how to apply their legacy systems to this new platform. And applications are easier to optimize; they are easier to re-architect once they're already running in the cloud. There, and partly because of your organization will have developed skills to do so. And then the re-platform is is what I would call it as, a, you know. You make a few cloud optimizations so you can achieve a tangible benefit. You will not change the core architecture of the application. For example, you want to reduce the amount of the time you spend managing database instances by um, migrating to a database as a service platform like RDS, for example, or migrating your application to a fully managed platform like Last I mean, if you're a large media company, maybe you could migrate your web servers. I mean, from on the prem AWS, and you just move. Maybe let's say you've got a web logic um, which is Java application to an Apache Tomcat, maybe an open source Kubernetes. So by migrating AWS, you are able to save, I would say, millions of dollars in um, licensing costs, maybe, or maybe you're able to increase saving, uh, saving and kind of have be more agile, and that's part of it. That kind of becomes um, a, a, a segment in this process. So that's a very um, important aspect there. And you know, uh, consider a scenario here. I'm going to talk about this. Whenever you are planning for migration and evaluating the scope of what may be need to move, it quickly kind of starts to become clear that there is no single migration method for everything. And depending on the type of application or component, the specific method used for its migration is very important. And uh, I'm not really going to get into specific migration details, but I want to really bring up. Uh, is the is the importance of decoupling the migration of your DBs and data stores from your other application components. And what makes this uh, uh, such an important topic is in the fact that you are dealing with the incredibly important resources of data. And the data needs to be secure, needs to be reliable, and have these varying level of accessibility. So when you're migrating applications, much of the time and energy goes into ensuring consistent or even uh, improved performance and planning and preparation is put into being ready when the switch finally happens and there's rarely any middle phase to worry about between environments and with your data because of this often one of the most crucial form of your application environment there may still be access requirement before during and even after the migration and this is one of the reasons that database and register migration is so important to consider and plan when handling the migration and though i'm not going to discuss again the actual migration just yet i just want to cover um, some of the important planning analysis step there. And it's likely that a lot of questions about your DBs uh, will be well known before your migration is even a discussion. I mean, things like the size, the schema, the types of the tables and the engine specific limitations are um, usually topics that are regularly discussed and reviewed. And if you haven't done any other database updates or move in a while, you likely need additional research when you're looking for information about access patterns and frequencies and connectivity methods and security and object size and whatnot there. And the questions continues to grow when you start considering any change to the schema, infrastructure, or engine that might occur as a part of the migration. And this may seem like a lot, but understanding these things, I believe, would always really help you. And uh, the requirement for your DBs are for a normal operations while migrating in your environment will need to be analyzed. I mean, think about this way. Are you really replacing anything about the platform for your database? 
Do you really know all the key parameters of your new environment? Can your app afford downtime or maybe how long can this downtime be and how much of the data needs to be migrated now versus later? And these are just some of the questions that kind of come to the surface when you start looking into the requirements. Part of this planning is also you have to understand your network. This is a very straightforward process, right? You will need to know the limitations of your network, how much of your bandwidth is available for you to use, how much of your network utilization can be, can your database handle in both your source and destination location. And in some circumstances, this can be adjusted temporarily in order to facilitate a faster migration. But in other cases, you may have to figure out a way to work with what's already in place there. And keep in mind that during the migration, you may be placing additional load on the DB. And how much of that additional load and for how long is the going to depend on the migration method and one more area to look in is in planning your talent i mean someone needs to know the source and the destination db engines which can be uh, multiple people if any changes are being made and somebody needs to know about servers the ports the fiber rules and how to handle these network requirements from a practical operation perspective as opposed to just theoretical and most of the cases this is too much for a single person to handle so planning and gathering who is going to be involved becomes very important and the last item I want to cover for now is planning your time. Database migration projects often include things like refactoring of the app which is by third part here, if you see here. Um, 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 and the refactoring process alone can take anywhere from a few weeks to several months, depending on complexity of your application and database. And if you have hard dates, be realistic about what you can achieve. Don't just go crazy yourself. You will end up doing nothing. And these are just some of the areas for you to focus on when you look at how a database migration differs from let's say if i'm doing this a direct application migration and that's something which is important and to do this you know we have this beautiful service on aws which i'm going to quickly show you called as uh, aws server migration so if you look at this as a service i'm sure it's like uh, so many of you you're already using virtualization right in your maybe current environment and you want to let's say, maintain much of your what you already built in order to move it to aws and this doesn't have to be something that you self-manage or build from scratch. So AWS Server Migration Service, or SMS for short, is a tool available for AWS specifically meant to be enabling an easier transfer of your virtual resources directly into your cloud account. And SMS is an agentless service which makes it easier and faster for you to migrate up to a thousand of on-the-prem workloads to AWS. And the service kind of allows you to automate the schedule and uh, to track these incremental replications of the live server volumes and makes it very easy for you to coordinate these small and um, large scale server migration. And, and you know, I mean, I want to share some requirements about the integrated before in service. There's there no like prereqs, but the main requirement is that the SMS is currently only available if you're migrating a VMware vSphere or a Microsoft Hyper-V and Azure virtual machine to Android this cloud. And you want to keep an eye on the updates to the supported source environments by checking the documentation. And one more requirement you want to be aware about is that SMS replicates your server VMs as a cloud-hosted Amazon machine image that can be deployed to EC2. This does not really move VMs into function or in the area, but it does convert a VM into the AMI. And one last thing I think you should be aware about, but if you are using this SMS as a service um, um, in that capacity, and you know, um, let me see. So this is my service. So if you look at this as a product, you know, one of the one of the last thing I want to talk about is uh, that if you want to SMS to help you transfer your server VMs from your origin origin environments in AWS, you must use what we call as a connector, and the server migration connector is a free. BSD VM that you install in your on the prem virtualization environment. And the connector kind of aids in the creation of appropriate permissions and network connection that allows the SMS to execute the task in your virtual environment. And once that has been completed, you are able to migrate up to 50 concurrent VMs at one go. And the SMS service talks with uh to the with the server migration connector and in order to um Ease the task of migrating from the server platform. Testing is also simple to automate because the migrations create EC2 AMIs, which can easily be launched and tested for verification of the successful migration. Monitoring of your migration is really made possible by CloudWatch and logging and auditing can be done through CloudTrail. And these are the great 
way to help with providing these continuous visibility in your migration and allowing you to set up these events and alarms based on the log entry and metric you see there and with which they can automate actions based on the behavior and that's also a beautiful um, service there and remember we spoke about a couple of times already about the user discovery of the application and things like this and that's where this new service called as migration hubs comes into play now what happens there that uh, well we have a good amount of discussion obviously about planning your migrations and different tools that can help in the migrating your resources one important area to bring up is the need to monitor your migration and migrating is not just about not just something you can set and then forget you need a way to identify what is happening how well it's going there if everything is running as expected or some other thing about this and this can all be specifically difficult if you're using uh, multiple tools across multiple AWS and partner solutions. AWS for a service called as AWS Migration Hub, which allows you to choose the AWS and these partner migration tools that best fit your need uh, while providing you the visibility into the status of migrations across your portfolio of the application. And this allows or this provides the ability to see the metrics and progress for individual applications, regardless of the tools being used there. And that kind of allows uh, you to quickly get progress from updates across your migration. So migration is, uh, is very important. And in order to view your assets in migration, you perform what we call as discovery using the AWS discovery tool or by migrating with an existing or integrated migrant tool. And once you perform discovery and start the migration, you can explore your environment with this hub there. And when the migration completes, Migration Hub will show you details about the resources that have been created by the migration. And for servers migrated by AWS server, migrant service, uh, you know, Migration Hub kind of gives you the links to these AMIs and that's kind of, kind of happens to become a part of this. So it's a beautiful, beautiful scenario there and kind of, kind of does the job here and uh, kind of, kind of, uh, everything. so it's very, very important at a point of time to kind of, uh, get this done and kind of uh, build in a build it up and a part of to do this and that's um, an important thing to achieve that in order to um, move in this direction you have to be careful you have to understand how this works so you can imagine that at all enough time there are different services which can happen there and since we talk about it uh, migration one of the services which can also supposed to help you is called as the database migration service and basically the whole objective of the service is to really help you create and um, you know um, move your database databases across the park and this is a service that helps you migrate dbs to aws easily and securely with a database migrate service and where you have a source db that remains fully operational during the migration and uh, minimize the downtime to the application that rely on the DB and the DMS service can migrate your data to and from the most widely used commercial and open source DB and the service supports these homogeneous migration like Oracle to Oracle and heterogeneous migration like maybe a Microsoft SQL server to Oracle it's all possible there. So what I'm going to do here is I will quickly try to show you something on this process behind the scene. Um, let me see what all we can do in here. Give me a moment. Let's see if I can give you something behind this process. Okay, I think I'm in. So if you look at this, this is my AWS account that I just opened for all of you. I hope I run a look at the account there. Um, what I'm trying to show you, I'm not sure how much we can finish it because migration is a process, a long process, but I'm going to show you something in this process what i will be doing here i have this ec2 instance i'm going to connect to that i will configure a mysql server as my source db for migration i will connect to a aurora instance that is on the um, rds service and try to migrate that if time allows us i mean everything uh, will be dependent on this so let me try and show you a couple of things about this and uh, uh, i'm sure everyone is aware about ec2 is an rds and it's not an ec2 is the uh, web server that provides you the compute capacity in aws it is designed to make these web scale cloud from easy for developers so imagine that i have my um, database running it on the prem in some kind of virtual machine that virtual machine is pc instead and rds is a service on which is a fully managed service for running your databases on aws so for this what i'm going to be doing here is Let's go to EC2 for us.
And I have an instance already. You will see it very soon. No, not this one. Yep, they have a lab instance here. I want to connect to this. And let's download the RDP. Everything going to happen inside this, okay? Let's open. I'm going to try and connect password. I've stored the password. For some reason, it's not letting me log in. Try this one more time. If not, then I have to figure out something else. But you know what? I can actually show you what happens there. Um, so this machine, basically, I, I was going to show you, uh, what do you say? Um, an, a, a MySQL instance, which was there, right? And I kind of had an option there, so I'll show you. So in order to do migration, what basically happened that I have this DB here in the RDS, or even, you know, I can go to DMS here. So what happens if you go to DMS as a service, what we normally do, and I'll show you that process actually, meanwhile, because unfortunately we don't have time, so I'm not gonna go back and put a new machine. So we create this replication instance. Now this replication instance is a replica of the instance that I want to migrate. So let's say I'm going to call this replication instance. And in that description, you know, I can do this for you. Just want to do this. And we choose a version, TMS3, TMAM, which, or maybe choose it to a, a micro here, maybe. Let's choose a micro. And in VPCs, I will choose all our VPC. And what we're trying to do here, we're trying to create an instance that is a replica of the one that's pretty much running anywhere. And then we can say we can have a multi AC fiddler setting. Let's say, you know, um, I want to do a dev or test workload and I want to be public accessible. So you can make your instance public accessible, but that's up to you there. And once you do this, you create this instance here. And what you'll observe that this service is it going to create an instance for me. And in about five to 10 minutes, this eventually will um, create an endpoint for me. And I can show you what happens there. And once I have this endpoint done, so basically I will use an application called a SQL Workbench, which is a SQL tool for doing the migration. And I can leverage this tool to kind of get my job done. So this again is a is a beautiful segment and uh, this kind of happens to help you. So this instance once it's done, I'm gonna show you in a moment there what happens uh, as a process. So that this can happen meanwhile. So I think this is, this is that we're gonna have let this happen there. So once this is done, I'm gonna show you how we kind of create a uh, instance. So let's say I already have a backup of um, a SQL server that's running on the frame or which is the place there. I use that and I create a replication instance with this DMS service. And from the service, I will actually use uh, and use that other instance as a replica. And that's the whole beauty behind this process. So you can always look at this. So what happens there when you're trying to do this process, there are a couple of things you want to do, uh, uh, but you want to be careful about. And one thing I would say uh, in this stage is security. I mean, uh, well, this isn't a security specific webinar. Security should always be considered, I would say, whether you are building a multi tiered um, globally access application or you're discussing migration with your uh, maybe, you know, environments like we're here. Security needs to have always have a place in the conversation. And with the migration discussion, I think our talking points are not really different from many of the topics that would normally be covered. I mean, my focus is uh, will likely be things that you've heard before, um, like protecting your data in the transit and at the rest, because when I'm doing kind of migration, you know, my data will be moving. So how do I ensure my data is protected at the rest and transit? And these may not be new topics or maybe new, it's important really to understand them in the context of if I have a multi-environment communication. Right now we have a multi-environment communication. One environment is, um, on the prem could be anywhere else, and the environment is database. And you have to secure data in the trial. And your goal should be to make sure that you can communicate easily between environments and protect the data. And this is where you try to reduce the risk of these unauthorized exposure by defining and enforcing requirements and implementing controls. And you definitely want to make sure you have defined data protection in 
trans requirements and I believe encryption standards based on the data classification to meet your organizational or legal or maybe compliance requirement. And also enforce your defined encryption standards to ensure that meeting these requirements is not optional. Additionally, you also want to ensure that there are tools and controls in places to help you with enforcement of the standards, which I think will go a long way towards helping you stay secure and travel. And the first and one of the easiest thing I think you can do is use authenticated network communication protocols. Use IPsec channels and transport layer security or TLS to kind of encrypt in transit, which will go a long way to reduce the risk of data tampering and laughter. And additionally, I one thing you should set up an automated tool to help you identify when other issues or risk become apparent and can also become very helpful to so using a tool or detection mechanism to automatically detect attempts to move data outside of the defined environment boundaries can be really helpful in identifying any threats to your security and prevent um, their exposure. With it at the rest, I mean, encryption is really the biggest point here and you really want to make sure that you have established and forced encryption methods in place for everywhere data is held in environment. And in addition to this, I think your key management solutions will play a big part uh, in your encryption for your data. And depending on the services within AWS and your client in your current environments resources that are using, there are several options that you can look into for helping you to maintain data security at rest. And for instance, a lot of the data Store services with AWS have options that are simple to implement where you essentially turn on encryption for that service. And for your current environment, if you're not already using an encryption key management solution, I think it will be important to evaluate and find a solution as soon as possible. And I know it can reduce the level of desired performance depending on the resources or AWS services you are using when you start to implement encryption mechanism. But it's all, that's why it's important to you know, have these conversation early so that any additional performance overhead encountered by your security measures can be considered for your migration expectation. And when it comes to securing your data use while migrating, while you're kind of focusing on general data access and permissions, and as with other areas of access control and permission that we usually talk about AWS, using a least privileged access model is going to be a great mindset to keep there. And users and applications should only have access um, to the specific data they need. Uh, they should be given access only when they need it. And they should only be able to access how you want them to access that. And I believe depending on the data store options you have available to you, the level of granularity you are able to provide in terms of what each users can access will vary. I mean, it's just important that to take that the extra work to make sure that no one has access to more than you should, or at least they ha only have access to appropriately classified data. And for limiting, I think when they should have access using AWS services and not even mechanical data that allow you to limit the time users have to access, that will become very helpful. And sometimes, you know, this could be done in a policy. And other times you need to look at automation jobs or workers, they can open and close connectivity methods to ensure that data is only accessed when necessary. And for limiting how you want users to access, that's when we go back to enforcement of these methods that you would establish when um, looking at protecting your data in transit. Making sure you only secured connections and protocols are used helps to avoid the accidents that can occur when those become optional instead of required. And well, that's all that I have in terms of a multi-environment security. And I know this all was all very broad and theoretical, but a lot of specifics will depend on what resources and tools and services you have available to you and what features uh, deploy to you. So that's something which is obviously very important there. Okay, so now you can see here, this uh, instance is ready now. Um, and once it's all good, you can see on the left, we have got something called the endpoints. And if I do this, we'll create an endpoint here. But when you do this, you have to define an endpoint. Now in the source endpoint, I will say that my identifier is a MySQL. So this is a MySQL instance that I wanna be able to create there. And you know, in this uh, case, you wanna um, have a, like an access to endpoint database. So in that case, we're saying the source engine is MySQL in that case. So you can see here, and you can see the pro I will provide the access information to manually here, and you can, you know, um, paste. Uh, so this is the server IP that I wanted to use in there. So I'm going to just paste it there again, and uh, 
I'm not sure how much it's going to work, but um, I'm going to use the master DB as master. There was a DB I already had in there before. So, uh, sorry, port is supposed to be 3306. And uh, master, user is master, password is uh, okay. And uh, if you go to endpoint settings, I'm not sure if it's going to work or not, but let's see. Let's see if it gives us something there. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, test endpoint connection. Choose a VPC, which is our lab VPC. And it might fail or it's not. I mean, it should fail because we, we don't have a DB running there. But what you do, what you were trying to establish a connectivity from AWS to that instance and telling, hey, AWS, uh, are you able to connect that? And let me just really show you what happens there once, once it's done. Even if it fails, it's okay. I'm gonna create an endpoint for all of this. And you will see this endpoint is all set to go. Now, once this endpoint is done, uh, you know, so this is a source endpoint you can see. Now we have to create a target endpoint in a similar direction. And I will say this is my target endpoint. And the target endpoint in this case, I have an RDS instance already. I have created that before for this, and you will see this is an instance that I have created already, and all it is out there eventually. And um, my endpoint identifier should be. Uh, 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 let's see. Why, 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 why? Manually, I want to give it. Yes. Please take the information manually. I already have the information in my notepad. I'm just trying to figure out. Uh, yeah, so identifier here should be Aurora. And the uh, rest of all the information looks fine to me. Um, let's put the password for this also. Okay, that looks fine. And we can go into endpoint. So I see what we have done here. We have created two endpoints. One is for the um, mass source and one's for the destination. And now with the DMS, what we do is we create a task. And a task is where all the work happens. You use tasks to migrate data from the source endpoint to the target endpoint. And the task processing is done on the replication instance that we've created. So we specify what tables and schemas to use for migration and any special processing like log requirements or control table and error handling, all these things there. So what you do here, eventually you create a database migration task in the section there. And in here, I want to create a task here. And we can define a task identifier. I can say I am trying to move from a MySQL to Aurora. And I have my replication instance, which is this, which you remember we created there. I've chosen my source endpoint, I've chosen my destination endpoint. Both of them are done. My question is I want to do an existing migration. And if you can go scroll bottom here, it says the target table uh, mapping so we can actually have some new rules here we can see we can add a new rules for example and you can define the set of new rules there and uh, it will ask you like kind of schema you want to add in this capacity so um what i will do is i don't have a schema here uh let's call it as a, yeah let's do it just call it as delete just for example and things like i wish i would have had the access to that there and i think that's okay i just want to show it there so it looks fine here and what i'm gonna do is just go and for a task here now what you will do here what you'll see here um it's gonna as you can see this is in the creating state and basically it takes some time to um do this job for me and since we don't have any data right now, so we can't read too much here, but I'm going to show you that. So what this will do, this will eventually move the data from that uh, source DB to Aurora DB. And you can see this is all done. 
and this task is all completed. And it's as you can see, this is the ready status. It's gonna do its job here, and it's gonna it's gonna kind of then further um, do a load part of it. So once the load is done, we can actually have this part you know looked inside of it. So this is how we do it, and you know we can kind of find stuff, and that's so we kind of do our database migration like this. It's already small. We're doing is there are like multiple steps, but that's something to spare. So that's again a very important. So whenever you are doing a migration, I think um, I mean the tools for migrating data to AWS Cloud are you know either unmanaged or these managed tool. And uh, um, there are some options for data migration depending on the volume of data and the velocity of migration. And if I have these unmanaged tools, they are easy. They are one and done methods to move data at small scale from your site to maybe AWS Cloud Storage and these will include options like um, uh, you know, resync or S3s or um, Glacier command line interfaces. And there are a lot of AWS managed migration tool that helps you manage the data migration tasks more efficiently and can be further classified, I would say, uh, where tools that can optimize or replace the internet, or maybe there are direct connecting tool that provide a print interface like S3, for example. So if you have a large archive of data or data lakes or a situation where bandwidth and data volumes are simply too large, I think you might want to lift and shift the data from its current location straight into AWS. And you can do this either by using a dedicated network connection or to accelerate uh, the network transfer or by physically transferring the data or you know using Snowball if your data stores can gradually migrate over time or maybe when the new data is coming from many different cloud sources. So consider these methods that provide a fully interface to S3. And these microservices take in leverage, obviously, um, or they can complement existing solution like backup and recovery software at SAN. And there are different technology partners and third party system providers that also offer tools for um, migrated migration. So there's only some like vendors that you can lose to can choose if you want to move the data part. So that's something like that. So this is how we can, if you know, uh, you can say uh, in the eventuality, we can migrate uh, to this process. And Obviously, everything kind of at this moment is is all about this segment, and we can kind of define job here. So that's the DMS, that's the service, that's how we use there, and uh, I think that's pretty much it I wanted to discuss in this segment here. We'll take a now uh, short break here. I'm gonna come back after the break, and we will then proceed with the next thing for all of you. All right. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of more things uh, in eventuality, and we will move further. All right, so in the last part for the webinar, we were able to kind of see how DMS as a service could operate, right? And that was something which is fantastic. And now um, I want to talk something on further on the capacity where we had these three offerings. You can see, uh, you can really see that we had the re-hosting, re-platform, and there was refactoring. If we can say refactoring, um, Refactoring is, oh, sorry, it's also a mechanism of reimagining how the application is architected and developed using these cloud native features. And this is kind of driven by a strong business need to add features and scale and performance that would otherwise be difficult to achieve in the application's existing environment. And if you're looking to, you know, migrate, let's say, from a multi architecture to a service oriented architecture to boost agility or improve business continuity, I think this strategy tends to be most expensive, but it can also be the most beneficial if you have a good product market fit. And then we have these risk what we call repurchase. Now, repurchase is basically you move from a perpetual license to a SaaS model, a software service model. For example, you move from a customer or CRM basically to a salesforce.com and then charge system to work or maybe CMS to Drupal there. That's one thing there. Then you have this retire. So retire is all about removing applications that are no longer needed. And once you've completed discovery for your environment, you want to ask who owns each application. As much as about 20, 10 to 20 percent of enterprise ID portfolio is no longer useful and it can be returned off. And these savings can boost your business case and direct your team's attention to the application people use and you know maybe reduce the number of applications you have to secure there. And finally, there is the retain, uh, which is referred as revisit. So you want to keep applications that are like let's say critical to your business for the business, but that require major refactoring before they can migrate it. So you can revisit 
all those applications that fall in this category may be a little point in time sensitive. So choosing a right migration strategy depends on your business drivers for cloud adoption as well as time consideration, business and financial constraints, and maybe the resource requirements. And replatform is something that's great if you're migrating for cost avoidance and and to eliminate the need for a hardware refresh. And I mean, there are different aspects. If I took a retire, is uh, if I do look at, let's say, retain, for example, let's go top down or bottom up. Um, retain, you know, the effort is less. There is no opportunity to optimize because you're retaining everything. You're just just not doing anything. Rehosting, the effort is a lot because you're going to rehost everything. Opportunity to optimize will be less in that case because you are kind of just moving assets there. Repurchase is like you will have put a lot of effort and then you're not going to have a benefit there, but replatforming is where you have effort and the benefit the same. And if I do a re-architecting, the efforts kind of become the ma the maximum, but then you can actually um, get the best benefit. So consider, I would say, a phased approach to migrating application and prioritizing these business functionality in the first phase or then attempting to do it all in one step and in the next phase, um, you can optimize application where the AWS platform can make a notable difference in the cost and the performance and productivity. And let's say if you're migrating application that leverages an Oracle DB and your strategy includes replacing Oracle with Aurora PostgreSQL and the best migration approach may be to kind of migrate the application and, you know, stabilize it in the migration phase and maybe execute these DB phase uh, effort in a subsequent phase. So there are common objectives that will improve application performance and resilience and compliance across the portfolio and that should be included in every migration and then you'd be part of that. So in eventuality, migration strategy should guide your teams to move quickly and independently. And you should be able to apply project management best practices that include these clear and budget timelines and business outcomes support this goal and your strategy should uh, always address that if there's a time sensitivity to the business case or business driver, for example, maybe a data center shutdown or a contract expiration, that kind of a compelling movement for you to migrate that. Or who will operate your AWS environment and your application? Do you use an outsource provider today? What operating model do you like to have in long term there? Or what standards are critical to pose on all application that you migrate there? And if everything like what automation requirement will you impose on application as and starting point for cloud operations. So, I mean, there are different examples. I mean, I can tell you like, we'll drive the migration timeline to kind of retire these specific facilities and use savings to, to fund the transformation of the cloud computing and time is very important, but I might be considering any changes that can be done quickly and safely while kind of creating these immediate savings here. And I'm also gonna insource core engineering functions instead of outsourcing that have been historically outsourced and uh, probably look at technology platform that remove these operational barriers and allow us to scale this function there. And business continuity is a critical driver for our migration. So I'm gonna take the probably uh, approach or I'll take the time during the migration to improve the position there where application risk and the costs are high. I'll probably consider a phase approach, probably migrate first and then optimize in the subsequent phase there. And these cases, the migration plan uh, tend to include the second phase there. And for all these custom development, you uh, wanna move to a dev DevOps model. So there are different mechanisms and, and kind of do this, but remember, for migration, everything starts with and will always remember stick to a business case there. And a migration business case, I would say, can have a, a scenario based on either a cost analysis or the cost of change or the labor productivity or business value. So you want to be able to figure out that what's the future expected cost of the AWS versus your base environment. What is the estimated migration cost? Or what is the expected ROI there? What's the business benefit beyond the cost there? And how will, uh, you know, using AWS will kind of improve your ability to, let's say, respond to these business changes there. So it's very, very important to kind of do this cost analysis and draft your business use case because your business case will go through several phase evolution and, uh, and, and, and then, then you will have these directional business use cases which can estimate the number of, let's say, servers and request with ROI, so you can make those informed decisions, and that's going to become an important part here. And you know, when you're going in this journey, there, one of the one of the things that um, also I believe needs to happen there at all point of time, um, that there are some. If you're going to move to AWS, right, um, um, things 
are all about data transfer, things about all the storage and databases and some of the things that will hopefully make, uh, will help make the most of your things and, and database and keep moving those, these, those partners. So eventually these are kind of do this and we've spoken about the whole business case modeling and everything around this. So the way you know, I wanna do this, the way I want to kind of show a couple of things. So before we kind of wrap up this uh, beautiful webinar, I'm gonna quickly talk about a couple of things. So if I talk about things like, let's say, um, AWS EFS. So there are some of the services that I wanna talk in terms of the storage part of it. So we have the service called as EFS. Now, when you're moving in from an environment where you have limited storage solutions, it's nice to know that you have a flexibility to find the best solution to use when concerning your storage for AWS. And uh, I'm gonna quickly review the three most commonly used storage solutions available for you starting with the most commonly used and the default um, block storage. So I mean, if I, if I uh, do this, let me, if I do this EBS, let's say, I mean, I'm gonna start with that, let's say. Um, if you do an EBS here on the AWS, so if you look at this as an option here, um, this is the default block storage volume, EBS. This provides block storage, level storage volume for use specifically with EC2 instances. And EBS volume behaves like a, Draw unformatted block device that you can mount as a device to your instance. And then, while you can mount multiple volumes on the same instances, each volume can only be attached to one instance time. And you can create a file system on the top of these volumes or use them in any way you would use a block device like a hard drive. And additionally, you can dynamically change the configurations of a volume attached to an instance. And with EBS, there are several configurations open to you. and the volume types that you can choose include both SSDs and traditional SSD options. And then we have these general purpose of volume, which is the most common type and uh, the default volume is by EC2. So all these uh, volume kind of, you choose them based on the performance. So you have an ability to adjust the level of performance you require. And these are, I would say best utilized when you need consistent and a high level of performance. And for um, the HDD volumes, I mean, we can have uh, more options, uh, I mean, if I am looking for a throughput optimized volume, there are frequently access. So you get different options that can happen to um, exist in that capacity. And that's what it is. So if you want a block storage, then this is kind of, that's about EBS. And uh, then there's something called as the EFS which I was talking about, right? Um, EFS stands for Elastic File System. It allows you to create a file system, mount the file system in EC2 instance, and then read and write data to and from your file system. And while that may sound strikingly familiar, uh, to what EBS is, there are some major differences to that. First of all, EFS can be mounted to multiple EC2 instances at the same time, which allows you to have a shared file system for multiple servers. And secondly, EFS is just a shared file system. It's a file storage system that uses the NFS4 of E4 and currently supports different versions there. And um, I do recommend that you use the most recent version. I mean, you can always leverage the two files, but EFS does provide one more difference, I think that can utilize, and this kind of becomes incredibly important while running a multi-environment workload, like when you're migrating that, the other difference is that your AWS housed EFS can be mounted to even your on-prem server. And the beautiful part, I can extend the AWS storage to all the way out of the on-prem server. So this is what we have there. And also, you know, when since we're talking about storage, how can we miss the service called as S3, uh, which I'm sure everyone is aware about this. So S3 is again, a sub object for a system that was intentionally built with a minimal features set that kind of focuses on simplicity and robustness. And to use all as features you do is create a bucket, which is a container for all your objects and then start loading in the objects. And the objects are the fundamental entity stored in S3, which consists of the object and metadata. While the object data is opaque to S3, the metadata is a set of kind of a name value pair that describe the object. In S3 and S3, once you've created the bucket, you can work with objects either through API or console. And S3 is a natively internet based service, meaning that access is provided through internet accessible endpoint, which does not mean that there's any loss or compromise on how secure that is. But you're gonna do this process. So you always have an opportunity to kind of build a solution around this as a process. Then, you know, one of the, one of the beautiful service that AWS kind of offers you uh, is storage gateway. You have something called as storage gateway. Now, 
there are times, you know, when during a migration or just want to have AWS cloud back storage for your on-prem resources, you need to be able to connect across environments. And AWS Storage Gateway kind of utilizes a virtual machine over a VM image in your on-prem environment that securely connects to the gateway endpoints with AWS. And this allows you to connect your local storage resources to AWS Cloud and allows you to add availability and fault tolerance and even scalability to your storage mechanism. So for solution storage, Gateway kind of offers a file-based or a volume-based and tape-based option. We've got three different kind of option with the storage gateway, which can happen to exist there. And, you know, uh, based on your requirement, file gateways or file-based solutions support a file-based interface into S3, and it allows you to store and retrieve objects in S3. Um, then we've got using all these protocols like NFS, for example, or NFS or, or SMBs, which is there. There's a volume gateway as an option or an opportunity. The volume gateway provides cloud batch for volume that you can mount as an iSCSI device from your on-the-prem application servers and with this volume based solution you do have two configuration option and there are these cache volumes and stored volumes and cache volumes allows you to store your data in s3 and retain a copy of frequently accessed data subset locally and these stored volumes can be a solution um you know uh, um, for for when you need to low latency access to the entire set and all of the data is stored locally and snapshot can be made from the on-prem storage and used to either recover these local volumes or create volumes inside of your AWS account there. And moving on, uh, the last part of this is the tape gateway. With a tape gateway, you can durably archive uh, backup data into AWS. And a tape gateway provides you a virtual tape infrastructure that kind of scales seamlessly with your business needs and eliminates the um, operational burden of services and scaling there. And one more tool that you know can assist when you're working between environments, I would say, um, uh, like migrating the, or transitioning to a hub environment is called as this data sync. Now data sync is basically a data transfer service which simplifies and automates and accelerates the moving and replicating of your data between on-prem storage system and AWS storage services over the internet, or maybe a direct connect. And, Currently, data sync supports transfer between NFS to EFS or S3. And this may be sound similar to like a storage gateway, but the major difference are that data sync primarily is utilized to transfer from an NFS source and that is going to be an EFS. You know, we kind of move from NFS to EFS there. And similar to storage gateway, data sync uses an agent, which is a virtual machine that is used to read or write data from an on prem storage system. And the agent is deployed on a VMware SXI server, or maybe you can use a data sync management console and then activate your agent there. And with these tools, hopefully you have some additional ideas of how you can really manage data transfer and access across an environment and kind of can do a job there. But this is something you wanna be um, able to do this and kind of do this part of it. And that's, I believe is is uh, uh, an aspect. And the last thing which uh, I wanna talk a bit about here um, is a beautiful so migration tool called Cloud Endure. So if you look for something called as Cloud Endure is a beautiful solution there. I mean, one of the tools that can help you with migration is Cloud Endure. It's actually a little misleading to call Cloud Endure a tool. It's more of like a fine-tuned machine that enables a machine, a much easier end-to-end -end migration uh, to AWS. And Cloud Endure migration simplifies and expedites and automates these large scale migrations from a physical virtual and a cloud based infrastructure to AWS and it automatically converts any application running on supported operating systems which allow to have a full functionality in AWS without compatible features. And then there is continuous data replication that takes place in the background without um, application disruption or performance impact which ensures that the data is sync in real time and kind of minimizes the cutting windows. And when migration kind of was initiated, you know, Cloud Endure kind of executes what we call as a highly automated machine conversion and an orchestration process and allows even the most complex application databases to run natively in AWS. And the continuous data protection engine works in memory, neither taking snapshot nor writing any data disk, which means there's a near zero, there's a near, there's a near zero impact on performance. And furthermore, I would say Cloud Endure is 
designed for a large scale migration and allows the replication of data from thousands of machines simultaneously without performance impact. And after initial replication, you can spin up all of your machines in parallel as well as execute you know, any post migration script at scale as necessary. And you can also manage the entire migration lifecycle and verify your readiness for cutover directly from the Cloud Endure console. And lastly, I would say Cloud Endure gives you the control to test your um, target machine as often you like in the prep for cutover by clicking just a button there. And it kind of provides you with an ability to quickly and easily shift your environment to AWS from your existing physical or virtual data center and provide, and it gives you private clouds or other public clouds. And, you know, we can see that while you can work on migrating your environments yourself using the tools and creating your own application and automation scripts to kind of handle environment transfer tools look like on tour can makes it very easy for a whole process this is a game and it's one of the you know a, a very primary tool uh, in this process there and you know um as we have seen in the last couple of hours there are i mean number of tasks that you will need to perform in order to plan and prepare and perform your migration and the good is that you don't have to do it alone there is something called as the aws map which is a migration acceleration program. Uh, it is designed to help enterprises which are committed to a migration journey. And MAP was created to provide consulting support, training and service credits. And the goal is to reduce any associated risk with migrating to the cloud to build a strong foundation for the operations and to help offset the initial cost. And the program includes guidance and methodologies for migrating these legacy system as well as a suite of automation tools to help speed up more common migration scenarios and AWS also kind of maintains what we call the partner competency program, competency program which allows companies in a partner network to demonstrate and prove their expertise in areas like migration and successful completion of a migration can be aided by leveraging the knowledge or uh, the tools of migration partner solutions and there are several different types of partners that can assist with your migration. So migration delivery partners, they are able to help with every stage of migration and including like getting hands on. And then we have these migration consulting partners, which can, you know, uh, provide expertise and training to help these enterprises quickly, you know, develop uh, specific capabilities or achieve these specific outcomes. And migration technology partners are also, which provides these tooling and automation to um to you can say um, um to help with all the phases of the migration journey which is important and a migration isn't likely to be something that you tackle completely on your own right when it comes to migration the best approach i think is to leverage all the tools and experience at the disposal and that's something which is there so that's something which this whole uh, thing has to uh webinar has to cover about this and as you know we can run close to the end on this webinar on migration. I want to take a moment to quickly review the application migration types. So what we kind of quickly covered in this webinar, as we quickly call them the six R, and they consist of rehost, replatform, repurchase, refactor, retire, and retain. And starting with retain, this focuses on identifying components that are either not ready or not necessary to migrate. And oftentimes when retaining will be used, it is important to consider if and how your migrated infrastructure and your retained infrastructure will need to communicate and then set up the appropriate and secure channels to do so with retire you still need to identify what components may need to be migrated but for the purpose of evaluating what will not be needed by both the migrated environments and as well as they um as well as any retained components and once the evaluation is completed i think the unnecessary pieces are eliminated and the applicable components are migrated and with refactoring uh, also seen as uh, as in re-architecting, you look not only at what needs to be migrated, but also at how that particular application might be re-architected to better utilize the advantages provided by the AWS cloud. The shifting from a traditional architecture to a service-oriented architecture, for example, could be one of the ways that you would refactor your application to move into the cloud. And then repurchase, replatform, and rehost are very similar, but of course, they have their minor differences with rehost. You were looking at close as like one to one migration as possible in this 
this case, you're looking to move quickly with the minimal changes with the replatform. You're still looking at a similar move, but also kind of considering what might provide a small and easy optimization to your performance or usability. And for example, maybe replacing a server, um, you know, running a DB engine with a RDS instance. This could make your database uses a bit easier and maintain or improve performance. And with repurchase, you're looking at places like marketplace for ready to run services configured for the cloud that will kind of get you features that you are looking for without requiring you to custom build a solution. And something that might fit into this category would be purchasing a firewall from a marketplace instead of trying to import, you know, or configure your own EC2 instance or the you know, part of it. And, you know, over the course of the webinar, you know, I kind of focus more on repos and replatform, but it's important that you look into all these options for your possible utilization. And the last thing I want to say about these is that it is very important that you look at your application specific needs to find the method that will work for the various use cases you will encounter. And trying to for I would say, a single method for all of your migration will bring about a lot more problem than a solution. So individually evaluate, make your plans, test your plans, and then reformat the plan if necessary. And as I said before, the more effort you put forward on the front end of your migration with evaluation and planning, the easier the actual work will be in that case. And that same thing is there. And that pretty much brings us to the end of this beautiful webinar. And I want to thank you all again for listening to me. And I hope you were able to add some value here. So Leela, over to you now again. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. So then we will jump right into the questions. We have a lot of questions today. Yeah, I'm going to bring that to thank for all of you. So this is one quick thing, everyone, uh, and just wanted to share a couple of things from this class perspective. So as you all have been a part of this class, and we all understand that Netcom is a leading partner, uh, leading vendor in terms of the uh, you know uh, building learning solution there, and with Netcom we got about 100,000 profession trained, and there are about 40K plus corpus clients. So we've got a huge experience behind us joining there. And in order for you to move forward in this journey, obviously you want to be looking forward what is the right path there. So this is the right path that you can look at this, that AWS gives you a learning path here where you can start from the technical essential as a course, and you can move all the way to become a solution architect associate or a professional. Like you can look at the journey behind the scene. It's pretty extensive. You're going to be knowing a lot of stuff around there. And from this perspective, you know, um, these are some of the recommended course that you can always opt for and kind of look in this direction, which again will be something uh, great on your side of it. So you can look at these recommended course and marketing assets. And um, I think Lila will be sharing these, this with, with the participants, right? Or uh, this slide. So you can always look at um, these as a collaterals and kind of understood them. And some of the latest new webinars that are coming for us, as you can look again on the slide, some beautiful webinars. If something interests you, apart from being a cloud ops, I think you should go for that um, eventually. And I think AWS is the future of everything. I think everything today in the world is kind of hoping AWS. So if you kind of uh, click on this URL, it will be taking you to the courses on the AWS side. And you can see this kind of gives you all the necessary options that um, and on the uh, Netcom side, so you can look at all these course offering that Netcom provides in AWS. Um, so if you look at that, we kind of did the migration here, and if I can just look on the migration side, we have the migration course listed there. Um, I think we do not have it here. But you know, one thing I can tell you uh, before we kind of uh, get back to Leela that AWS is the hottest thing in the market right now. I mean, I'm a guy who does it pretty much day in day out, so you can imagine this kind of make, makes a lot of more difference there. So you have a lot of course offering there. If you're starting with AWS, start with the tech essentials. If you're midway somewhere, yeah, that's so. So this is migrating to AWS. That's true. We, we, this is the course we kind of evaluated <coughs> today. And you can look at this. Uh, this is more of like a high level introduction. We did it here. And then we've got a lot of other webinars that's kind of coming there. So you can <coughs> always look at these set of course offerings, see what can make sense to you. And based on that, you can choose and over to back you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we had those covered. Um, and those links uh, in the slides, the slides are in the handout section of the GoToWebinar Viewer um, panel. So you can refer to those. I know we had some questions concerning whether there would be a certificate 
for today's webinar and there will be, I believe you will need to message us at webinar at netcomlearning.com to get that certificate. I don't think it comes in your email just like the playback does. So um, then we will go ahead now and jump right into these questions. Let me scroll up to see what is first. Um, so they wanted to ask if the slide deck was available. Yes, we did answer that. Um, somebody's asking, will AWS be a good career path in the coming future? One word, brilliant path. Don't think about it, just go. That's how the world is moving right now. Wonderful, let's see what else we got. Um, so what is AWS Migration Hub? Um, it's more of like a set of suites or tools that I've discussed before. It's going to help you um, to kind of uh, build these set of services around this and you can leverage the Migration Hub for tracking your application and their processes and things about this. So it's more of like, um, you can say more of like an offering from AWS, which eventually gives you um, a way of how you can build this stuff. So it's, it's one of the beautiful um, services around this process. It's, it's if you want to track all of your migration process, I think this would do it for you. Wonderful. And I'm seeing one other question. And once we get through our questions, we will wrap up. Um, the last question I am seeing right now is what is AWS DMS? Okay, so I think if you've spoken there before, we spoke about DMS, I gave you a demonstration. It's a service that helps you migrate databases to AWS quickly and securely. If you see, I kind of use the DMS service to create a replication instance and migrate data from the source to a destination. It's a service that can help you to migrate an on-prem database to AWS. Perfect, okay, and we did have another question come in. They want to know if you have any thoughts for controlling costs once the migration is complete, and they also wanted to know um, what was the contact for requesting a certificate. I will post that uh, email address in the chat box for for everyone, and you can go ahead and answer that question. Your thoughts for controlling costs once migration is complete. The cost is a continuous effort. You can just have cost control one go, but eventually the best practice is that. Uh, look for the well architected framework in AWS and kind of do your job here. So if I'll show you quickly. So if I want you to go to do what is called a well architected framework in AWS and read that, that will eventually give you an understanding of how this would work like. So that's going to be a part uh, behind this process. Uh, wonderful. Do you have any other final thoughts for us then before we wrap up? I'm good. I'm good. I'm okay. good. Okay. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Michelle.